let's, uh, let's try to get started. Let's, uh, let's take our seats if we can. We'd like to start the next session this morning. It's great to see so many uh, conversations. I hate to interrupt them, but we're, uh, we'd like to be able to uh, finish, start lunch before dinner time this evening. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce the leader for our next session uh, this morning. Our next session is uh, on materials for energy storage. And this will be um, uh, led by uh, Dr. Yu Chi. Uh, uh, she's a staff research scientist working on computational material science uh, at the Chemical Sciences and Materials Lab in General Motors Research. She's been involved for many years uh, here at Brown in the very uh, fruitful collaboration that we've had with General Motors on materials research. And uh, she received her PhD from Caltech. Thank you. OK, so. I want to be the first uh, bad person here. Um, so I'll try to maintain, like, uh, uh, we have only one hour. So uh, I hope the two speakers, you can finish your talk in 20 minutes. Then we have uh, you sit there uh, to have, be questioned for 20 minutes. <laughs> And I don't need uh, like further introduction about uh, the energy storage materials because uh, Sarah's uh, had this wonderful opening talk. I counted about uh, like eight out of ten materials uh, applications he used in his pictures are either uh, are related to alter alternative energy and energy storage. Uh, so. Um, uh, let's start the session, and we, uh, I'm very honored to introduce you uh, as two outstanding speakers. Uh, first, uh, as um, uh, Dr. Tony Goss from A123 System, and we all know A123 is U.S.-based um, uh, company making uh, lithium-ion batteries. Um, so, um, Dr. Um, uh, Goss um, is uh, by training as a uh, polymer scientist. He had been with A123 for about 10 years, and um, he had been uh, responsible for making a lot of materials inside of a uh, uh, lithium and battery used in this iPad. Um, there are like separators, um, electrolytes, additives, active materials, binders, you name it. It's, uh, there are a lot of materials inside of a lithium ion battery. Um, and also in his talk, he's uh, he, and also in Event 3, he's responsible for uh, manufacturing techniques. As, as equally important as the, the materials um, uh, in the battery, um, the, about half of the price in the, for a lithium ion battery goes to raw materials, and half the price goes to uh, manufacturing. So I hope um, uh, he can uh, share some insight and uh, in how can we drive the materials into real productions. And then the next speaker is um, um, Professor um, Gert Seder from MIT. And when we ever mentioned computational material design for lithium ion batteries, and his name uh, will be the first one to pump out. Uh, actually, um, he's uh, my hero in the competition award. I, uh, uh, for many other applications I worked on, I actually look at the method he developed, um, uh, not necessarily in the battery field. Uh, but uh, uh, right now, um, I mean, by training, he is a material scientist, a computational uh, material science and thermodynamics. He has been uh, demonstrated to the world that how powerful computational techniques can be, especially in the uh, lithium ion battery field. At the beginning, he kind of just used that to uh, understand the materials. Then he started to uh, explore the uh, unknown domain of the materials and predicted structures never been made um, before. Uh, and um, that's, I, I forget how many years have you started the, um, uh, the experiment part in your lab. But uh, even though he uh, has good, uh, always collaborate and it's good, uh, it's very good and collaborating with industry uh, experiment groups and government uh, labs, um, he can't wait to reduce to practice of, uh, uh, for his pr predictions. So kind of he started his own uh, synthesis group. Um, so without further ado, we'll have uh, Dr. Um, Tony Gus uh, to uh, have his, that's our first speaker. And I will bring your talk here. And thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, uh, Professor Guduro and uh, uh, Dr. Baraka, for inviting me to this forum. Um, the uh, my goal here is uh, today, uh, and I'm 
I should add that I'm very happy to be here at, uh, in, um, with the Brown community because um, my, my daughter graduated with an MFA from RISD two years ago, so I, I know the area pretty well. <laughs> uh, uh, the purpose of my um, uh, talk today is not to discuss the intricacies of material science, but to talk from a perspective of an industrial researcher engaged in uh, uh, a multitude of uh, materials-related projects um, from the persp uh, within a company that had its source and inspiration and original idea and invention at a university at MIT and then over the course of a number of years, right now 10, grew into a 2,500 people uh, um, company uh, on three continents. I'd like to present basically the main factors that um, we have to pay attention to, that are necessary, the ingredients to take the invention, the idea created uh, by our uh, researchers and graduate students and so on, and to transform them into a product that the public will want to buy and pay a reasonable price that will provide a return on investment to the entrepreneurs that take this idea and put it on the market. How do I change the slides? <laughs> oh, here, here's the button. <laughs> okay. So um, maybe I, I, I should return. Uh, uh, the title of my talk, Crossing the Cosm, comes from a famous book that many of, uh, uh, of you are pr probably familiar with, almost 20 years old book. And it dealt with this um, crossing the big chasm between the idea and the product. And the um, Materials Research Initiative and Materials Genome Initiative, I think, touches upon a very important factors, the ingredients that are necessary not only to create an invention, but to implement in, in, in life. Uh, I will not spend time on things that we have already seen. I don't have too much time. But uh, I would like to focus first on what drives the material selection that our researchers are focusing in uh, at universities and industrial and national labs. And uh, what are the requirements, very fundamental requirements, that are necessary in the selection process for the material to become a successful ingredient of the product? Because as uh, uh, you heard before, the materials are only part of the battery. Half of it or so is the process. And then if you make, uh, take a lot of batteries and put into a battery pack, this battery process and materials is only maybe two-thirds of the cost, and the rest is electronics and packaging and everything else. So the requirements, very fundamental, uh, are high energy. We want our batteries to be light. That's what it means. High power, it means not in laptops. We want our laptop batteries and cell phone batteries last and the cell phones 10 hours, 20 hours, and so on. So it's not the high power. But in some applications, such as UPS, such as automotive applications, transportation, or on-demand power uh, in big power plants, and so on, the high power, that can, which means that the energy that can be um, provided and delivered at a very high rate is important. We want our batteries to last forever. Typically, we don't complain if the battery lasts only two or three years in a cell phone because we, the product cycle is so fast. But a battery in a car that is a substantial part of the cost must last uh, uh, a lifetime of the car, 10, 15 years. For power plants and large applications, their horizon, they want the battery to last for 20, 25, sometimes 40 years. Uh, so good cycle life, which means how many charges and discharges, and calendar life, which is storage, uh, are very important. Uh, a calendar life is, an, uh, is a difficult issue in general because a battery is a life, unstable thermodynamically system. And it, as a life system, it keeps degrading, right? So 
even if you don't cycle it, the capacitor slowly goes down because of all the side reactions and so on. So there is a finite life to any battery which is a reversible chemical system anyway. Of course, we want good safety. We want very good abuse tolerance. One cannot predict what the consumer can do with the battery or any, any device. All kinds of crazy things are happening and the battery must be built in a safe way and not to be like a hand grenade in your pocket, basically. And the most important, uh, and, and this is not a joke, a hand grenade in your pocket, because if you compare the energy in a TNT and a high energy battery, they are not that far apart. The only difference is the rate of energy release, but not the energy content. And the batteries must have, of course, they have to be built and sold at low cost. And I will um, uh, touch upon those uh, factors that make people buy new things, and including batteries and so on. So uh, in order to get high energy, we are developing materials with very high uh, electrode potential versus standard uh, electrodes and so on. We are talking about five volt systems that refers to the potential versus lithium-lithium plus um, electrode couple. That is a very oxidizing potential. The material doesn't work by itself. It is flooded with the electrolyte that provides the uh, medium for the movement of lithium uh, ions and, and counter ions in it. And so if we built a battery uh, with a five volt cathode material, it means that we have to have an electrolyte system that will take those five volts and will not oxidize will not oxidize because the oxidation causes degradation, gas generation, and all the swelling problems that we sometimes see in our consumer devices. Uh, the anodes, the other negative part, battery, uh, battery chemists call uh, the uh, cathodes and anodes, just the reverse, the, the, the electrochemists uh, call them. But the anodes, which means negative electrodes, typically lithium, uh, in primary batteries or uh, all kinds of graphite and carbons and intercalation compounds uh, on the negative side, they have very low potential of the order of minus three volts versus standard hydrogen electrode. It, it is a very re reducing potential which basically uh, causes reduction of anything in touch with it, almost any solvent, salt, additive, and so on. And I will not go into electrochemistry of, the, of all these uh, uh, SEI layers and so on, because uh, there is a time for a different time for that, which means a solid electrolyte interface, which is a critical part that basically prevents the battery from a runaway reaction, which according to thermodynamics, it should occur. It is, SEI is the passivation elements, that is the protection layer between the working battery and the disaster. So what are the drive, other driving factors developing new battery technologies? Um, commercial applications. We uh, are innovating to sell products. We are an industry. We are not a research lab. Uh, we, of course, invent new things, invent new processes. But our final goal is to see our product on the shelf or in a large production facility, uh, power plant, or something like that. Um, we love novelties. Uh, uh, right now, the novelty of the day is the graphenes and the graphene-based materials and so on. Before that, we went through all kinds of different phases. But at the end of the day, you know, whatever and how much time we spend in the labs developing new materials, new structures with very interesting properties that sometimes can be calculated and uh, sometimes they are a surprise. At the end of the day, the consumer looks at the price and see, says, well, too expensive, even though it may last 50% longer. So we always have to be mindful of that consumer psychology that if it has higher, higher price, only p Apple people don't care. But so, <laughs> so um, in order to have our product adopted by the market, and I, I, I mean wide consumer market, very quickly, the cost is the primary challenge 
to develop efficient, low-cost technology and product that will be bought by the wide marketplace. We don't want to be niche players. So how are we going to develop? Of course, we have used for many years the Edisonian approach. You take 6,000 times, times of carbon and fiber and you get the, finally you get where you should uh, to get your light bulb. But we have much better tools right now. Combinatorial chemistry and high throughput processes are right now quite widely used by industrial and, and, and um, university laboratories to come up with new ideas that sometimes you would never come up by logically looking at the components. It is very important tool, but it is only a tool because once we are faced with thousands of compounds that we have to test and the tests are involved and battery cannot be tested just by putting a piece of this material on a balance and checking the uh, weight of it, but it's a system with many components. It is a very interdisciplinary field. Uh, uh, we have to have tools that will test those hundreds and thousands of materials, the infrastructure, the test methods, how to package, how to make efficiently tiny samples that will, whose properties will correspond to something that is real life size. It, it's a challenge to develop, to go from that combinatorial uh, affymetrics like approach where you have a, a, a little uh, a droplet of something and you can put uh, uh, hundreds of those or thousands of these uh, tiny um, uh, dimples uh, with one drop of material into something that will give you performance that is relevant to what is going to be happening in the real size battery. We are looking for materials which are less expensive because even, you know, if you look at uh, Aldrich, Sigma Aldrich catalog and you see the solvent there costing you know, 20 times more than in, in big volume, um, you cannot rely on these uh, prices used by research labs to develop a good uh, financial model for your product. You have to find the least expensive components. That includes eliminate, eliminating metals transition metals, uh, which, for example, are co only mined in difficult to get places. You know, Katanga, Congo, Cuba, Siberia, mm, far away places in China. Um, and this is a, 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 a real challenge. To look at the um, periodic table, and the choice of good materials and metals for battery materials is not that great. And if you eliminate the, the ones that are difficult to get or expensive or, or whose prices are going from $10 a, a, a pound to $50 a pound in a matter of weeks and nobody can predict, and that's happening all the time, we focus and have to focus on materials which are widely available, the supply is stable in good places, and which are inexpensive to mine and process in an environmentally friendly way, which is very uh, challenging for these chemistries that use a lot of extraction and uh, uh, involve processes to purify. What is, people don't realize the lithium ion battery technology has demands on purity of the materials which is comparable right now to semiconductor technology. We measure impurities in PPM. If we don't, the battery will not last, will not perform well or will become unsafe. The reason is this basic uh, fundamental instability, thermodynamic instability. All these little impurities have unpredictable effect on cell resistance, on micro shorts, on uh, uh, clogging the pores, and all kinds of things happening during the lifetime of the battery that we want to avoid. So how, how do we go um, as a company, as a startup basically a few years ago, to take uh, an idea developed in a university lab and implement it in such a way uh, to, to develop a product. We need collaboration, and we have used collaboration very widely with all kinds of parties, whoever is willing to collaborate with us on agreeable terms. Industry laboratories, and I will present uh, some examples, national labs, a lot of collaboration with them, and 
uh, uh, companies uh, um, in the world who produce a myriad of products used in a battery system. Uh, battery science and technologies is an incredibly interdisciplinary field. You have basic material science, both the, on the organic and inorganic chemistry side. You have high temperature synthesis. You have metallurgy. You have electrochemistry at the highest level, in organ organic and inorganic electrochemistry. You have thermal modeling, electrical engineering, uh, plastics processing. Uh, you have diffusion processes of all kinds. You, you have polymer processing for separators and all the constructions. So a team that uh, is to develop a battery from scratch has to be has to involve many, many specialists from many disciplines. And I will present some examples of, of those that we grabbed from all over the world. Now I'd like to discuss the critical point in crossing the chasm from the invention at the university to the successful product. And this is kind of a product cycle curve that many of you probably are familiar with from the uh, previously mentioned book by Jeffrey Moore, the Crossing the Chasm. So the early stages here, we, we have innovation, we are developing a, a great idea, we test it in the lab, it works, hmm, how do we create a startup? How do we create a product out of it, right? And that's my, um, that, that's my subject in, in the next few slides. So there is a big problem to cross that, and there is a lot of mechanisms and a lot of factors that have to be used to fill that gap to be successful in jumping over. Um, the, the, the major problem is this. If you want to introduce a new product, you have to convince the, the customer that it's worth to buy it, right? Very often, if it's a revolutionary product, you have to change a very ingrained user behavior. How do I convince these people to buy it if they are happy with what they have? So it has to be a very convincing uh, a, a product and properties and characteristics, and we have to hope that we can change the user's behavior and try it. Oops, what happened? Um, okay. Why is, why is this chasm so deep? Because um, there are many ingredients to it. There must be many fillers or, or steps or breaks that we have to find from different fields to fill that gap that will allow us to cross it. So in order to do that, I will now address the six components that we have identified in our practice as the critical to filling that gap, that chasm, uh, when going from a prototype to a product. First is the people. You have to have a right team, as, as I said, very in interdisciplinary team to put all the intellectual potential of these people together to attack a multitude of problems, sometimes related, sometimes unrelated, in order to cross over and uh, to basically overcome the technological challenges. Relationships. We cannot do everything ourselves. We need those relationships with the industrial labs, with the university labs, with the uh, uh, national laboratories and so on, to use efficiently the human potential elsewhere. We cannot grab and build a team in a month of you know, 200 people or something like that that would cover all the disciplines because of the Boston is an expensive place to live, for example. So there are five factors that people have to con uh, consider. It's the technology itself, the development and so on. Uh, not the last and not the least is funding. How do you convince people to believe in you to provide the initial funding. There are many mechanisms of it. Private sources, there are venture capitalists, there are angel investors, but there is also government. And there is a, it's a very important role for the government to play at a certain stage of the pro development process to provide this uh, seed potential. And this is a risky business. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't but it's a nature of the discovery process and the development process that we don't work on things that we, will, we know that will happen, it'll be good, fine. If it were that easy, everybody would be doing this. Manufacturing, oops. Oops, I don't know how to go back now. 
previous. Manufacturing. Now we are talking the real world, right? Building plants that, this is manufacturing. This is not a software development that you can do in your basement if you want, really. This is building plants often on multiple continents that you have to invest hundreds of millions of dollars to build a manufacturing plant. It's not a service. It's not software. It's not a little product. It's a large scale product. The batteries that we build, for example, for buses, they contain up to um, over 1,000 individual cells, each 20 amp hour capacity when your uh, cell phone is maybe one and a half amp hour capacity. So these are huge plants, very complex, that uh, have to be there. And very important, the customer. And customer, in our case, is not the individual customer in the market. It is the large industrial companies that uh, we want those people uh, to convince that they cannot live without our batteries. The people that we gathered in our experience, and this is uh, A123 Systems experience, were gathered from top companies in the world to attack all these, the multitude of problems that I mentioned. Uh, in our labs and plants, we have people working from companies that you certainly, and universities that you certainly will recognize, and I will not spend more time because I'm probably running out of it. Um, the re relationships that I mentioned right now, I'm, this is just a cross-section of, of the companies, of the laboratories, of, uni of the universities that we have worked over the years, that we work actively right now, that we have day-to-day -day interactions, testing their products, them testing our products, components, processes, analytical, pro analytical procedures, instruments, sensors, a multitude of factors. So it is very important to draw on the depth of experience out there and not to, be, not to reinvent the wheel. It just doesn't make sense. And there must be a mechanism that will make this collaboration between us and st startup companies or larger companies very efficient and easy and, find, and the easy to find specialists in all these fields that would be on demand without having to relocate, which is always a problem. So this is, this is the, the last component that I, would, the, that I wanted to list here as necessary to crossing the, uh, the, uh, the cast. So what is innovation? Uh, it's basically we are taking a new technology and want to create a value out of it, a product, something that the public w or, or somebody else, uh, a client uh, or customer will buy. This is not a result, very seldom, but almost never now, a result of an individual sitting over his desk or in the lab and, and uh, you know, the old way work. It is, it is the, the effort, a group effort, of many, many people who have to collaborate very efficiently and share tremendous amounts of data and then just wait until the production data starts flowing in uh, to basically to come up with the idea, turn it into product and commercialize it. So all these people have to believe, they have to uh, have the vision of reality. What is the final purpose? So they don't spend time on developing things that don't matter, that, that they develop uh, little tricks that are very funny and often you, know, you can show it to, to, to colleagues and so on, but in the end they don't matter, it's a waste of time in the, in the final uh, scheme of things. Uh, and, and we want to take this process of innovation and creation of a, pr a uh, new product to obtain a unique benefit, a new product that hasn't been there, that we have no competition with, that's our dream, right? That we are the first, we are the only ones, and the competition will come. No question about it. Because if something is hot, there will be competition. So the IP protection and all these matters are very important for us. Uh, the funding sources, and I'd like to hear to uh, really make it clear that without the government help, the building a manufacturing company, not a software company, but a manufacturing, large manufacturing company, without the government help of the different agencies and so on, it would not be possible at the scale that it, it, it has happened. 
because of the tremendous capital investment that is necessary to start up the process. It's not making, you know, 10 gadgets a day. It is building hundreds of thousands of batteries uh, a week or a, a month. It, it, so it takes hundreds of millions of dollars to build, to put up the plant right now like that with all the infrastructure and so on. Have all the right relationships to make sure that these people that we are buying those sophisticated materials, when, that they have a st stable suppliers to them. So they won't one day say, you know, okay, I ran out of this, I cannot ship because the whole production line stops. So the coordination of all these streams of materials is important too. Uh, the federal investment is absolutely critical in many sources, at universities, at national labs, and in some cases, in large industrial labs, uh, to provide the new ideas. Then, once those ideas turn into something promising, and you have demo, you have a little, uh, basically, gadget that shows how it works, then angel investors and VC people come in, and uh, once you are successful and you, you show that you can make this and sell the product, only then you can think about going public and public to invest into, in, in, in your company. So as I, I'm showing here, the USABC, United States uh, Automotive Battery Consortium, and the Department of Energy were very important sources of uh, startup capital to, to uh, build the uh, plants that we bid. Private markets, of course, too. And uh, the states have very important role in providing uh, a good infrastructure, tax breaks, and all kinds of things that allow one to start a company uh, and gather all the people that you need to do this. So um, the new business models are emerging, and they have been emerging for some time, basically. How to uh, combine the university research and basically move it to the industrial uh, arena, um, uh, open sourcing and all these uh, uh, shared databases, the materials and processes and modeling, which is very important, is uh, necessary to accelerate to, uh, instead of doing a, a lot, uh, somebody, a previous speaker mentioned, instead of doing thousands of experiments uh, in the lab and spending I don't know how many hours, uh, a lot of this stuff can be done approximately by modeling and modeling of different mechanical, electrical, which are very well known, but electrochemical modeling of full battery systems with uh, my hats off to uh, Professor John Newman's group at the uh, University of Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, who have uh, been developing with his students a model that is very useful and predictive of the real world battery performance using real world input parameters data that you can measure, not that you can, uh, that you are guessing. Uh, and in terms of manufacturing, um, I'd like to only point to one thing. The university research is a small scale research. It's a conceptual research. And uh, very often, uh, sometimes the researchers at universities take a, a too big a, a, a leap of faith that what they developed at a very small scale is actually, or that it makes sense in practice at a large scale as a product. There is a gap between research and commercial manufacturing. And there, is a, there must be a collaboration and contacts that two sides come together and understand where each side is coming from, what is necessary really to take the material not just test this one property on the second property and be happy. Because there are a lot of interactions that uh, it takes to build a system that works in practice. Sometimes things that you would never think of, right? Considerations that just working on a synthesis of a cathode material never come uh, into play. Uh, so mm, the, uh, if somebody thinks about commercializing his lab idea, he, sh he or she should not do it alone. It sh it sh there should be open communication and asking for questions. Does it make sense to go this way? Will those properties be compatible with all the other properties that have to be 
you know, fulfilled for a given system and so on. There must be exchange and common sources of, of knowledge that people have uh, access to. It's not enough to test material in a coin size cell, in a coin cell and so on, and say it's good for a, an a automotive battery because the scale of the problem is incomparable. So um, we do believe that, well, that we are an example that effective collaboration between universities and industrial labs and national labs uh, can bridge that gap. And we have shown how to bridge it by putting all these six components without neglecting any one of them and cross the gap to a product that is uh, on the market. The, what is extremely important and <laughs> is the customer pool, as we call it. When you have an idea and concept and prototype and so on, you have to find some, somebody who will grab you from that big scale mountain and will pull you over that gap. In our case, it was Black & Decker five years ago, a company that we worked with for a two, uh, of, uh, one or two years before when we had the first sales that was interested in the, uh, very high power products that provided the seed capital and capital to build the first production line to help us because manufacturing money is tough to come from a VC, uh, from VC market and so on. So it is very important to find people outside in industry strong financially and big companies who believe that in the product, you show them that it works and they want to buy it and help you to do that because it is in their interest, not only in our interest. They want to be the first to have the product in their product. So uh, the second point, at every point of the process, we have to understand what is the final requirement, what with the set of requirements, under what conditions the product may work. As I said before, you cannot guess how, what people will do with your product. Um, what temperatures, what rates, will they run over on the parking lot through it, and so on. And uh, finally, as I said, somebody has to help the bill, which is all the funding uh, agencies and, and, and processes. So in, a, in a energy storage batteries, the technology is not inexpensive. It's a highly sophisticated, very complex product. It has to be safe because it is a very high energy product, right? But um, in the end, the costs are coming down, not as fast as we would like to because of the materials cost and the, and, and the cost of the big plants and operating them. But uh, strategic considerations, the lack of uh, 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 the pricing of oil on the, and, and the vagaries of pricing systems and so on and speculation drive the price. So uh, there is a gradual path to electrification of our transportation systems and so on. And uh, going through um, HEVs, which is this kind of a small scale, taking baby steps to full EVs, electric vehicles and so on. Uh, uh, to, to a point where basically you provide, like we built uh, two megawatt trailers and then you put 10 next to each other to build a huge uh, multi-megawatt uh, installation to, uh, that uh, uh, power companies use uh, for peak power shaving and uh, frequency regulation and storing wind energy and, and so on and so on. But this is a totally different scale of, of the product than when you think a battery, a little thing in your pocket. So we have to work together. It's obvious, not only from my presentation, I think. And uh, as a final note, I, I'd like to say that we are technology agnostic as a company. We are not married to a particular technology, even though we developed a particular brand of safe cathode materials with high rate capability and power capability. We will take whatever looks the best, and we will work with whoever is willing to work with us to mutual benefit. The market that we, are, that we want to concur is extremely competitive and very nationalistic. We have to take this into account in our planning, strategic planning, in our technology, technology uh, development and partnership selection. It is a fact of life. 
We want to have high trust, and we have been very fortunate to have high trust relationships with our partners. We've never had, a, with a high level thing, any breach of trust, and uh, which was very important in our end. And our model is, is very flexible. We want both parties to share in the benefits and in the spoils if the product is successful. So this is, we will share with anybody and everybody, our collaborators, and I'd like to emphasize that, what makes sense. They need to know. If you need this to know to do your work, we will share with you. If you don't, why? Like the government. Uh, so we've had very uh, extensive experience working with those, uh, with the multitude of teams. And the technology, individual technologies, there is a risk. They may work. They may not work sometimes. It's fact of life. Uh, uh, but it is very important to have very experienced, financially stable, big players that will help you to get through some low points. Thank you very much. Time for one or two quick questions while, like, uh, uh, get set, set up your uh, uh, computers. Do you have them set? I found your comment about the uh, investment in scale is very important. The intersection between universities, laboratories, and companies. And I'm wondering if there should be what, what's, your, what's your take on federal investment in a new kind of strategy to uh, invest in university scale up? Well, I think that, as I, as I said, we, we've gained a lot from uh, the uh, national lab experience, databases, materials development effort, and processes. So we are very much interested. We apply for grants. We have a division in Michigan, in Arbor, Michigan, that basically only does government-funded research and so on. So we participate and have always participated in those consortia and, and, and uh, government-funded initiatives and would be interested in that. So it is an important part of our uh, looking out process, with the searching process for the next great thing. We have to do this. We cannot do it everything in house. I have one quick question. Traditionally, the materials from its development to the uh, item production to 20 years. As we know, December Mabry, we have 20 years of market start from its commercialization. So for this, in the December Mabry industry, what was the time from material being, from its concept to uh, uh, production? Uh, well, look at an NMC, NCM material, right? The, the nickel, cobalt, uh, manganese, cathode material. About 10 years? Well, first paper was 2000. Yeah, well, I, I, I was shooting. Okay, so <laughs> thanks our uh, speaker uh, Oh, but the batteries are on the market for two years, so 10. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say, I think that's a useful answer to the decade, but on the other hand, uh, interpolation of drop, I think that would be 80 times. So, you know, that's not the point. That's what made the look of my battery, basically. So, True. That's not where you can talk about. We, we want to shorten it, so there's no question, but the more demand of your material, the tougher the qualification process becomes. We had it easy in the 90s. It's much more difficult to meet the requirements that we have right now for the new materials. More failure modes that we have not haven't had in the past. Well, uh, so let's see whether there are his way to uh, accelerate this process is through high throughput uh, uh, initial calculations. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll try to skip a few slides. I, I really like getting awfully behind. So, um, so what I want to paint you is a vision on, on uh, how we can discover new compounds with interesting properties. And uh, I, you know, I'm a as a material scientist and engineer, I'm very well aware that a, a, a material is not a compound. A material is much more than a compound. It's, it's in many cases, many things to many compounds together and how you process them. But the part I'm particularly interested in is, you know, uh, what is 
about them in the world of chemistry in terms of compounds with uh, interesting properties. And, um, you know, if you sit down today and you decide that you want a material for an interesting application, uh, you're going to start by pro hopefully writing down the requirements for that material. Maybe it's a good cathode material, maybe it's a new thermoelectric, maybe it's a you know, magnetic material for an application. And so the questions you will start asking you, you know, what, what are the properties of known materials? Uh, well, most of the time you don't know. That's actually the answer. For most compounds, we don't know did these rocks, actually. And I'll show you some numbers on that. The second thing is, what new useful materials of compounds might exist that we haven't actually made? And the answer is we really don't know either. Um, and then here's a, a point I want to strongly make. Every material design problem is a, optimiz a combined optimization problem over many, many properties. You know, there's usually one we highlight, like the energy density of a cathode. But in the end, there's like 15 properties that matter. Because I can make you a lot of high energy density cathodes, but none of them, my friends from A123, would want to put in a battery. Because, you know, they need to have high power, they need to be safe, they need to be cheap, and all the other things. So it's always a constrained optimization problem. And you can't do constrained optimization if you don't know all the properties, okay? which in most cases. And part of the materials design problem is that, you know, we start scaling up material when we know 10% about the material. That's, that's, that is ultimately what is going on. And as we start scaling it up and putting in products, we find out all the things that are wrong with it and that we have to go back uh, and change. So uh, here's some numbers, you know, and, and I think Krishna will have probably better numbers than a quick search. You know, today there are about 50,000 to 200,000 known inorganic compounds. That's not the word of organic chemistry, which is several millions. But, and that depends on how you count. Now, Guess how well that property matrix is filled out if you take sort of basic properties of materials like, I don't know, the conductivity or the elastic properties or so. It is filled out below 1%. Okay. If you want the elastic constant, like actually the, the tensor, not just the bulk models, it's known, you know, the elastic constant matrix is known for about 200 compounds. Superconductive transition temperature is actually one of the best ones. It, it's known for about 1,000 compounds. Remarkably, it's one. It, it's the property we actually know remarkably well across compound space. The dielectric constant is known for a few hundred compounds. Okay, there are fifty thousand. The problem is of the order of ten to the fifth, ten to the sixth. Okay, so we are well below one percent in coverage. And I, I, I found this old map. I sort of feel like what we're really trying to do is, you know, uh, this is a map that's uh, known by Acacius, uh, which is uh, a few hundred years before Christ. And, and you know, we're trying to sail up. Everything in old maps is always surrounded by ocean. That's the unknown, the ocean. And, and, and we're trying to sail up to America here with this map in hand. And that's kind of what we're doing when we design the um, So, you know, of course, we, we can do better. Uh, you know, today, um, you know, I was a practicing metallurgist for a long time and always thought, this is crazy. This is crazy. You know, in one class, they teach me quantum mechanics. And then in other class, they make me refine ore and like actually make an alloy out of it. Uh, and, and the two never talk to each other. You know, I think my quantum mechanics professor didn't actually know what an ore was or an alloy. <laughs> um, and, and you know, it's great as a student that you can be naive. I think naivete is one of the greatest things to make you do stuff, because otherwise you worry about all the problems. And you go like, well, we know all the equations of matter. I mean, why can't we just solve them? And I had dreams that we were actually even going to predict social behavior of people because, you know, it's all just molecules, I guess, or so. Um, well, so we barely made it to materials, okay? Uh, but, you know, in principle, we can do this. And, you know, today you can do this pretty well. If you're talking about basic properties of compounds, you know, predictive accuracy is not really the stumbling block. Yes, do we need better methods for some properties? Absolutely. But there's a lot of stuff we can predict. Diffusion constants, band gaps, you know, surface energies. I would argue that there are a lot of things we can actually predict better than measure them, and we can definitely predict them faster. Uh, because there's a lot of things people measure that aren't particularly accurate as well, which I, I think should be said. So that, like surface energy sometimes span like you know a factor of 10 in the literature. Uh, you know, there are plenty of these, these kind of examples. So uh, you know, here's voltages of battery compounds, experiment versus computing, some things you can do pretty well, but not that important right now. But the nice thing about computing, once you can compute things, you can scale things. If you can compute it once, you can compute it twice, you can compute it, you know, as many times as you want. And again, that's what we've learned, you know. 
if you put information in a computable form, things move very fast. Uh, before, <coughs> if you can put signals in electronic form, measurements, you can manipulate them very fast. It's the same with computing. So, you know, this was the idea of the sort of material genome project as a high throughput project that we spend all this money, you know, in the science community developing methods to predict things and then we calculate them on top of silicon. And we go away and we write a paper. Uh, so can we compute on everything? And I must say that, you know, uh, you talk about interaction in industry. The Materials Genome Project, as we launched at MIT six, seven years ago, was 100% funded by industry. It is only later that the government, I mean, we spent several millions of dollars funded by companies because the first person who came to me with the idea was a vice president of Duracell at the time, uh, who came to me uh, somewhat naive. She actually didn't have much of a science background and said, here I heard you can calculate things. Can you just calculate it on like every possible compound? And your first reaction is like, oh God, another sort of crazy industry person who doesn't know anything. Uh, but fortunately, sometimes my brain connects to my mouth faster than my gut connects to my mouth. <laughs> and, and I sort of had the reaction like, yeah, and it'll be a million dollars. Um, <laughs> and so that was actually in 2005, 2006 already, and that was the launch of what we started doing high throughput computing. We set up infrastructure to compute things on a massive scale uh, at MIT. And I want to show you that that's actually well within reach. So, you know, you do your math, you have of the order of 100,000 compounds. If you want to just know the energy of a compound, which is sort of a basic property with which you can do thermodynamics, you can do reaction energy, you can do phase stability. That takes you about one CPU day. So if you want to do all known inorganic compounds, it's 3 million CPU hours. That's nothing. That is nothing, 3 million CPU hours today. If you want, say, electronic structure information, band structure, from which you then can get things like mobilities and electrons, optical behavior, it's probably about a factor of 10. But it's 30 million CPU hours to know this about everything in, in the inorganic world. So if you take Hopper, this is a, one of the new supercomputers at Lawrence Burton Lab, at NERSC, uh, that they just put in. It would take you 36 hours, and you're done. It's, you know, so it's either 36 hours on Hopper or like 12,000 people for five years. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to put this in context. You know, DOE, um, I have a, a love-hate relationship with DOE, and you're going to notice this throughout the talk. It has a program which they call Insight. Uh, I think it should be called Extinguish. But, um, uh, Excite gives away every year 1.7 billion CPU hours, and it's usually to do like 10 molecular dynamic simulations or something. Uh, what I'm trying to show you is how much you could actually compute with that and give it out to the community. And this is, for once, I want to be serious. You know, you could do so much more with that if, if the government would actually change how they think of computing and computational delivery uh, to the community. Um, so um, we did this for quite a while. I'm going to spare you the history. We had a lot of company funding at MIT. Uh, we did this in part as consulting, as MIT company funding. Uh, and after a while, we sort of found that you know uh, we were using all this data internally. I, I had set up my own experimental group and really learned that the best way, in my opinion, to interact between the theory and the experimental community was through data delivery. Uh, I hate to say, but experimentalists don't like to use code. I, I would say if you're a theorist, you know, get used to the program, they really do not like to use code. That's a model that we tried to push 20 years ago, it work. But they love data. They love data and searchable data. And so that's how we started working, and then we thought, well, let's set this up for the whole world. So we renamed ourselves the Materials Project. Uh, we started working, our first partner was Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and we moved everything to a national lab because, you know, universities don't have permanency. National labs are much better to run these things. We got professional people, you know, I used to think I had graduate students who knew how to write computer code, and I started working with real professionals, database people, mathematicians, uh, computer scientists, and I realize now that um, I'll, I'll stay polite to my graduate students, but it's a totally different world. We have scalable computing now, novel database infrastructure, and so uh, since then we've added new partners, and there's a few new that are going to come online with this. And it was really sort of a, the idea is a project to compute everything that's computable and deliver it to the community. Um, so, I think I've sort of said this, um, we really want to fill in missing property data, assist people in predicting new compounds, but also 
we're not going to be the ones designing your materials in the end. We feel that you know it's the larger materials community that has to design the materials. But we want to provide as much data as we can to do that. We either do design or to build higher order models. You know, a ton of people come and ask me for the elastic constant of some compound. And you know, I can't even write a paper anymore on that. that that's not of some academic interest anymore, but people still want it because they are doing some finite element modeling and they need the elastic constant. People ask me for an energy. I mean, it's like, you know, it's not worth my time to actually go to the computer and calculate that energy. Writing the email takes longer. So a lot of this trivial stuff we try to automate and deliver to the community. Uh, for the computer geeks among you, uh, here's the architecture. Um, um, we have a MongoDB type database, or a document-based database, uh, which I find ironically is called NoSQL. I think there's no computer scientist in the world. Um, okay, because that's supposed to be a joke. Um, so uh, the, the second piece to the software is essentially the whole automation engine. This is all the scripting, the language that the, the you know, it's the engine under the hood that does all the, like, sends thousands of jobs out to computers, keeps track of them. If they, you know, if they don't converge, it sends them back, and does all kinds of things. And then there's a whole interface. Uh, and <coughs> the whole GUI and uh, how you actually then use that data to get processes with. So uh, at MIT, we have 150,000 calculated compounds. Uh, the public version, because it's being rebuilt with higher precision, uh, higher accuracy, data correction uh, is only up to about 20,000. Uh, but I like to say growing daily, it's not quite growing daily, it's sort of growing every month or so. Um, but there are many things you can do. You can just look for materials, it's a bit like a database. You can look for compounds and it will tell you what to calculate it on. Uh, you can just calculate reaction energies, sort of very trivial stuff. Uh, you can do phase diagrams, and if I had more time I'd show you. But we can do quaternary uh, compound diagrams, uh, look at where the compounds appear on the reducing or oxidizing conditions, all that stuff. Um, there's a, because of my, my heritage, the first wheel app was a sort of lithium battery property explorer. Uh, there's a structure prediction. I, I thought this was an esoteric thing. Uh, it's actually the most used app so far. There are now over 7,000 crystal structure predictions actually that have been requested and the site's only been up since October. <coughs> so again, these are sort of fairly trivial tools, at least, you know, we, we, we like to think of big, big design applications. So this is just stuff that people actually want to know. Uh, here's like, you know, uh, your favorite phase diagram, lithium iron, phosphorus, oxygen. Um, so uh, here's our user base. This is uh, from about a month ago that I updated. Uh, we have uh, almost 2,000 users. 30% uh, is out of industry. Uh, it was really a remarkable how well they jumped on that. Um, uh, the rest is sort of academic, government, and some people that identify as other students. Um, you know, very good feedback. Our industry users are often our most vocal ones, both positive and negative. They're the ones who really like it, but who also point out the things that they would want to see. Um, <coughs> so uh, what I'm going to show you very quickly is a few things we have done with it in my own group uh, at MIT, but I want to make sure I have five minutes at the end to sort of give you what I think are some general observations. So, uh, it's out of the world of lithium batteries, and you've seen that introduced. Uh, my own work focused on the cathode material, which is the storage device um, for lithium ion. And so you can now high through with calculate. You know, you can calculate thousands of compounds. So what is the voltage of them in a lithium battery versus their at least their theoretical capacity? And you can go through different chemistries here. So this is actually all calculated, ad initio calculated data: phosphates, borates, silicates, uh, sulfates. And of course. Um, you know, this is not a design plot because, of course, if you're on high energy, you'd like to be out there, high capacity, high voltage. But, of course, you know, as pointed out before, uh, if you go to high voltage, you have serious problems with the electrolyte and safety, and I'll say something about that. And if you go to high capacity, it's very hard to keep your material stable as you cycle on lithium. So, you know, this is one of the things I was saying in the beginning. It's not just about one property. You're not the super impose on this a whole lot of other properties. And that's what we do. I'm going to show you one, which is safety. Uh, you know, safety is a major issue. Um, this is the famous laptop picture, the famous car picture. This was in, in Hangzhou, Hangzhou, China, uh, electric taxis. Um, and so uh, safety is a complicated problem. You know, safety in a battery, I always compare this to an airliner crashing when something goes wrong. It usually more than one thing tends to go wrong when a battery fails, a bit like with an airplane. You know, when one engine goes out, it can still fly. If the hydraulics also fails and the pilot uh, goes unconscious, then you have a problem. Um, and in the battery, it's the same. One major issue is, and this is what Tony talked about, I'm sorry, 
um, uh, that the cathodes become very highly oxidizing when they're charged. If you go to high voltage, they become very highly oxidizing. The electrolyte is an organic solvent, so you've got a super oxidizer, an organic solvent, about 10 micron apart in a package. And so that's the problem. So one issue to look at is how oxidizing the cathodes are. And this is what you can calculate, and here's the voltage of thousands of cathodes calculated versus the oxidation chemical potential. You know, and just as was mentioned before, so this is more oxidizing, so less safe. This is more safe, less oxidizing. As you go up in voltage, there clearly is a trend to become less safe. You become more oxidizing, and, and I agree with you. There's a lot of people, you know, doing materials optimization very sequentially. They look for a high voltage material to give them high energy. They try to cycle it so that it's stable now. And by the way, then they check safety. And so they've spent just three years of work, then they find that the safety is not good. So why didn't we do the work? Uh, I have other slides I can show that almost all the high voltage materials people are working on in the literature will be, will be remarkably unsafe. Um, so um, I'm going to show you a, a very quick design example. So, this is, so then you data mine this data. Because it's not just about getting data and sorting through it, you want to learn stuff from it. And here's for phosphates, the voltage you get with different redox couples uh, versus the, the sort of best case capacity. And you know, you want to stay below this 4.5 volt line, in my opinion, sort of like taking that as an arbitrary line because of electrolyte and safety issues. Uh, and then, of course, the product of the two is the energy density of the cathode. And I've taken this is the 600 watt hour kilogram per but one hour per kilogram line, which is ultimate phosphate, the material you just heard about. And so I'm sort of setting the goal, I want to do better than that, so I want to be to the right of that line. And as you see, the news is not very good. Because here's the material that's known. Here's manganese 2 to 3. So you want to be below red to the right of this blue line. This material is well known and doesn't work very well. Uh, copper would be a good redox couple, but has all kinds of other issues. A copper one ion would probably go in the electrolyte. So, so it's a pretty slim field here. Unless you go for double redox couples. You look at the native 3 to 4 and 4 to 5. They sit in reasonable voltage. If you stack them, you would be out there. So uh, you could use molybdenum. Hey, okay, if you could use three electrons, molybdenum 3 to 4, 4 to 5, 5 to 6, you'd be out there. So we, we try to focus on the native, and we really set our, ourselves the design exercise. Should I pick up the phone? You know what? The, this is my phone charge. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They still need better batteries today, aren't they? So we set ourselves the design exercise, find a novel vanadium phosphate with double redox couple. Okay, one that we didn't know yet. So how do we do that? How do we create new crystal structures? So here's something we data mined. So we want to make new compounds, things that have never been made before. This is a data mined chemical substitution pattern. So what this is, is all the, most of the periodic table on one axis, most of the periodic table on the other axis, and the color coding, it tells you how easily two elements substitute for each other, keeping the crystal structure the same. And this is data mined out of you know, the 100,000 known crystal structure assignments we have out of nature. And so very light here means that they have very high substitution ability. And of course, this is actually the lanthanides. You can't read this. So we know that lanthanides substitute very well for each other. So we now use this in a reverse mode. You know, we can put compounds on this map and then see what other elements we could put in those compounds to try to start to change the chemistry. So it's like we're sort of working backwards. We start from known compounds, and how can we get from known compounds to our existing novel compound? So here's one we came up with, totally new chemistry. This material doesn't exist. It's a lithium vanadium double phosphate. Uh, it was never made in the lab before. We made it in the lab before, uh, and it actually, uh, this is actually real cycling data. So this is all the way from computing synthesis in the lab and making it. Uh, let me show you another one. This is the one I'm most proud of, even though it probably won't make it as a commercial material. Uh, for a while, I thought, you know, the prompt to do the safety is work with carbonates, because carbonates tend to release CO2, not oxygen, when they decompose. So it's like a, a battery with a built-in fire extinguisher, because that's how you extinguish fire, you put CO2 on it. So, you know, we wanted to make carbonates, and we found computation in that lithium metal Phosphocarbonate or carbonophosphates, as we call them, so you have carbon groups and phosphates, would be good ion conductors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so uh, the, the bad news is uh, nature knows no lithium containing carbonophosphate, not zero. It knows a few sodium carbonophosphates, there's a few rare minerals. 
Uh, so we calculated them. We have now made them all. We have made about 17 different synthetic materials in the carbonophosphate class. In the lab here, cycling of one, this is the iron one. Again, this is not ready for prime time, voltage is a bit too low. Capacity is sort of respectable, but not, uh, you know, not amazing. Uh, but we are working in different materials in that class. So again, a group of materials that's computationally designed, there is no equivalent of them now known in nature, made in the lab uh, and tested. So I, I want to end with sort of what's in store on the materials project and some, some final observations. Um, so the way the materials project works is we tend to work, um, uh, we start from an applications and we look at either somebody who wants to drive that application and come to us with here's the properties we need. Uh, and then what we try to do is we try to put our efforts in properties that are useful in multiple applications so that we can get the most bang for our buck. So you like energy, of course, you can use in a lot of things. Um, here's some of the things we're actually sort of working on. Uh, here's some of the applications we've worked on that have driven this. But I want to show you something new we do in just two slides. So, you know, people came to me and uh, were interested in, like, photocatalysis. Photo -catalyst. And if you talk to people about photocatalysis, again, it's the same problem of not desi of designing sequentially, not, not in parallel. People worry about the band gap for absorption, uh, the band alignment with water. And then they test all that out, and then they test it, and of course, it's not very stable in water. You know, the bad news is that most materials are actually not particularly stable in water, especially the ones with interest in band gap. So we put that up front, and we say, can we learn to calculate stability in water? So that's what Corbett, you know, the great uh, Belgian scientist who made what he called Corbett diagrams, which is essentially stability diagrams in water. We've now developed a methodology to calculate stability in water, which is great for corrosion, for photocatalysis. We actually use it for hydrothermal synthesis to guide hydrothermal synthesis. So here's a calculated Corbett diagram at the initial. Here's an experimental one. So we can now do this for every single compound, all of those 100,000 compounds. We can do an analysis of whether they're stable in water. And here's the bad news, you know, if you're interested in nitrides or oxynitrides, um, here's the Corbett diagram of oxynitrides, and there are no nitrides on here, which means they are not stable in water, of course, as we know, and this is the same for all the oxynitrides. So that's the bad news for polar catalysis. Okay, so let me end with sort of, you know, this is the vision of the materials project that, that, that we deliver data that sort of enables you to make better materials. But let me get to my points. Um, you know, I, I've worked with a joint experimental and theory group, and I've done a lot of interaction with industry. And yes, we design materials on occasion, and it's fun. I love to do it. But in the end, it's the experimental people and the people in labs that will design materials. It's rarely the theory community that's going to design materials. And I think what our job is is to enable them uh, with both insights and data and capabilities. Um, so I think, and this is a, a vote for the government, I think government computing needs to come out of the Stone Age. Uh, the model of the big iron computing, you know, uh, pentascale going out to exa, I believe it is, exascale. I think the government should become more like Google. Uh, government computing centers, uh, they literally measure their success by how busy you keep the process. Okay, if you don't believe me, go and check it. That is the measure of performance of a government uh, computing facility. It is not the output. It is how busy you keep the processor. And if you do that model, what that means is you, you go for very large uh, jobs with short long long times. Uh, so our kind of work, materials project work, you cannot do on supercomputing facilities today because it's essentially the opposite. It's a large number of small jobs. So inside and things like that are not available. Okay. We solved the easy problem, which is making computer data available. Computer data is clean. It's controllable. We can get it from one source. We can almost have control over all computation. As, as, as Krishna pointed out, experiment is just the opposite. It's everybody in their lab doing things. And we, we need to handle that problem. We need to start collecting experimental data, at least bring it online, uh, and we need to stop writing papers. You know, we write papers and we don't make the data available. We should do it in opposite order. We should make the data available, then write the paper. Um, I think we should start talking seriously about how to make materials, too. I do think, and you know, I may be naive, but I do think that 20 years from now, if we were to sit in this room again, we would, we're, we're going to be spitting out materials with interesting properties. 
because you know computing is getting better, the techniques is getting better. I think you can see where the vector is going. Yeah, we need to do a lot of work still, so you shouldn't stop funding us. But, um, <laughs> but you know, you know what's going to be our limit is how to make all this stuff and how to make it the right way. So today I already spend most of my money on the people in my lab on trying to make these new compounds, and that's the first thing. <laughs> sort of, can you come up with a synthesis route? You know, synthesis is black magic. I mean, it's unbelievable. If you ask even a really good synthetic person, you know, my head spins after a while. It's like it's all it's all experience. It's um, you know speeds of execution. But we need to start getting you know science and at least predictability. Um, and, and the last point is really that data should become infrastructure. You know, um, today, if you're in the material science community, uh, large infrastructure is like the light source, the synchrotron. That is large. That's, we talk about billion dollar infrastructure. Data is still not considered as infrastructure. You know, we fund it as science, not as infrastructure. And we really need to start thinking at, at, at treating it as infrastructure uh, for the community. So I think with that I'll end. And, uh, guy and I my theory is bite off small chunks if we're gonna try to build some big theory of synthesis we're never gonna get there and uh, you know so there are uh, there are, we're looking for example at hydrothermal synthesis today and have a certain level of predictability already in hydrothermal synthesis because you know you can figure out it has to do with solubility issues it's like if you can if you make a compound that you can drive out of solution, and there's quite a, you can control the pH and where you drive it out of solution, so you can start building the <coughs> ability. Uh, I think that's what we have to start doing for other things, you know? I don't think it's as hard as we, you know, kinetics is this very vague thing always in our mind. You know, I, I always go, kinetics isn't a theory, it's usually an excuse to explain something we don't understand. And, and I think, you know, uh, we may need to start, we may need to, start pushing that harder and just 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 get it just start trying it you know 25 years ago when people said you want to do quantum mechanics to predict all these properties people said you were crazy too and i think maybe we think of kinetics as the same problem now and you know it has to be helped by a lot of in situ characterization time result characterization which is really coming online i mean if you look at the new characterization tools coming online is a lot more spatial and time result resolution the time resolution, I think, should really help the field of sort of kinetics and understanding synthesis. Um, I'd like to uh, touch upon a uh, difficult problem of verification. Uh, even for simple compounds, uh, when you look up the boiling point of uh, well-known solvents, right, you get range of three, four degrees, something like that, often. You go to the NIST uh, ChemWeb database, it's a different number. Now, if you, you can calculate at any level of theory and so on, but then how do you make sure, how do you verify which number is the one that in real life will be observed using the best methods? Yeah, you know, it's a great problem. I would say the answer is a lot of hard work. And that's usually, I hate to say, it. it's, it's, uh, it's painful, for a whole lot of reasons that there's actually often, like you say, often variability in experimental data. So I'd love to have for everything I want to compare to one hard number and people tell it's 3.75, so I know what the right number is, and that often that's not the case. And, and we have found many cases where we find actually the things that, that strongly disagree with the calculation, you, would, you usually find the experimental error that way. Because, you know, one of the nice things about computational quantum mechanics is that its error is not random. And after a while, you start understanding its error. So, you know, when something is off by a whole electron volt and everything else in the same family is off by 10 mil electron volt, you usually kind of, the problem comes from experiment. But, you know, validation and verification, most of the time, we should spend an enormous amount of time on it, and often more than on the computation. And especially in the materials <coughs> project where, you know, we feel that the data we're pushing out to the community has to be validated, and in some cases even corrected, it's become an even bigger issue. 
because sometimes you do verification sort of by knowledge in, in your group. The data remains sort of imperfect, but the corrections are in your head. You can't do that when you push out data. So, you know, some weeks we spent with multiple people uh, reading like 100 papers on crystal structure measurements to actually do our, you know, to see how many times did we get it right. Unfortunately, there is no better way. The only, you know, the only sets of data that are sort of more complete is, uh, you know, crystal structure determination is fairly complete, sometimes in error, but fairly complete. And a lot of, ther some thermochemical data sets are pretty good. But most else, they are not even electronic data sets. So you can't even like do it on, on autopilot. It's like, you gotta go and look at the papers. And, and you know, I, I always wanted to be do statistics because sometimes you end up with the German paper from 1937 uh, for a crystal structure determination. And, 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 you know, I found papers, I'll give you an example, where a crystal structure is in a database and we don't agree with it. And you go on, you trace the papers, and you find that it actually was never seen. But it's somebody in a paper who said, I didn't see it, but just because I think it's parallel with these hours, it should have been there. And that made it in an experimental database. So it's not always the theory that's wrong. <laughs> um, more questions? Come on, follow up on that, just insist. Uh, Exactly from this concept of prediction of the chemistry of a material to its reduced per, uh, uh, production, is the synthesis the bottleneck or something else? Is, is the bottleneck the coming up to find out what the candidate is? Or the product? Or like testing and validate is actually commercially uh, okay? So where's the bottleneck? To, to I think there's sometimes a lot of system level things that. You, you don't always know ahead of time that you need to check for them. That's, that's, I would say, one thing. I mean, you know, I'll give you an example. I, uh, unlike Tony, I have a startup in a totally new chemistry for electrochemistry, magnesium electrochemistry, where you use totally different electrolytes. So you don't have the, the, the background and the experience to even know what to worry about. You just, at some point, put it in a system and you go like, oh my god, this, you know, this reacts with the electrolyte. And, and, and there's impurities, for example, which, so sometimes even knowing what you have to worry about is problematic. Was it that the unknown unknowns? So, <laughs> and, and so many areas, like, we still haven't really fully solved this. Everything that we have solved everything by competition, yes, right? From no. the prediction, <laughs> then you have to do the best. So, okay, if there's no more questions, uh, we can end this session. And we'll